Welcome to a new Research Spotlight episode of Synthesis Workshop. My name is Fabricio Politano and today we are pleased to feature Dr. Alessia Petty. Alessia completed her PhD at the University of Greenwich where she worked under the supervision of Dr. Kevin Lam on developing new electrochemical methodologies. She then continued her work in reaction development as a postdoctoral research fellow in the Professor Frank Glorious Group at the University of Munster. Most recently, she joined Merck as a research scientist in drug substance development. In this episode, she will present cyclic bifunctional reagents enabling a cascade energy transfer, where she displays the use of this reagent for ratio and diester selective annihilation combining synthesis, mechanism discussions, and high throughput screening. Alessia, we are very happy to have you with us. Thank you for joining, and let's get started. Hi, everyone. Many thanks to the organizers for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to share my research with you today. I am Alessia Petty, a research scientist at Merck since a few months and former postdoc in the Glorious Group in Munster. Today, I'm presenting you part of my postdoc activity, which focused on photocatalysis. First thing you need to know when working in this field is that you could use different sources of light for irradiating organic molecules. One option is direct photo excitation, but in order to do so, you need to rely on harsh UV light. And therefore, since UV light is highly energetic, your selectivity and functional group tolerance could be um, affected. Another option is then um, exploiting light in the visible region. Since it's less energetic, your selectivity and functional group tolerance is improved, but um, you need a photosensitizer in order to exploit this kind of radiation. In this case, the photosensitizer um, is absorbing energy in the visible region, getting excited and transferring this energy to an acceptor, your substrate of interest, whose triplet state lays at lower energies. This catalytic method is different from photoredox catalysis, where you have a redox interaction between photocatalyst and acceptor. As you see on the right hand side, you have different options in terms of photosensitizers, which can be both metal-based, but also organic-based. At this point, you might be wondering what applications energy transfer can have. ENT can be used, for instance, to break the sigma and oxygen bond in oxime esters and form two radicals, an alkyl transient nucleophilic radical and a persistent ambiphilic iminyl radical. Different polarities of these radicals and also their different lifetimes ensure the reaction with a coupling partner, such as olefins, in a region selective fashion. These reagents, for their ability to bind to two different sides of the olefin, are called bifunctionals. And the strategy of using bifunctional reagents and inserting them into coupling partners, such as olefins, can be quite powerful since it's allowing the construction of several bonds in one operation in a controlled manner. However, some limitations are also present. When the olefins are sub disubstituted, no control of the diastereoselectivity can be achieved and a mixture of diastereoisomers will form. Additionally, in most cases, formation of these radical fragments is limited to a carbon-centered transient radical and nitrogen-centered persistent radical. Usage of two carbon-centered radicals with different polarities and lifetimes is difficult to achieve. The idea behind this project is to overcome these two limitations of bifunctional reagents by employing for the first time cyclic bifunctionals. The latter undergo a first energy transfer, as you see here on the bottom left, to generate an azirin intermediate, which upon a second energy transfer event breaks at the CC bond to form a CSP2 radical and CSP3 radical. The different polarity and life time of these radical fragments dictate the order of insertion to olefins and other coupling partners to form an heterocycles in high degree of regio and diastereoselectivity. 
Before going deep into the project, I would like to share with you how this idea was born and how the selection of the starting material with the appropriate properties was executed. In the Glorious group, we have different subgroups and our motto is discovering synergy. It is indeed thanks to the synergy between different research fields that we had the idea to exploit it cyclic imines such as dioxazolones, which are commonly used as lithium ion batteries additives as our cyclic bifunctional linkers. When using the freely available NTECR software for predicting the triplet state energies and spin distribution of this dioxazolone that you see on the left hand side, we understood that replacing oxygen with carbon and introducing substituents such as methyl groups in C4 position would decrease the triplet energy of our substrate of interest, allowing energy transfer with most common photosensitizers. We therefore proceeded with testing in the lab the most promising isoxazolone starting material, which you see here highlighted in blue. When we then tried our substrate in the lab with an excess of acrylonitrile as coupling partner and iridium F as photosensitizer, we were pleasingly able to form the pyroline type product in high yield and characterize it via X-ray. I hope at this stage you're curious enough to discover more in-depth the reactions mechanism. Triplet energy transfer between singlet ground state 1A and excited state iridium F, which we use as photosensitizer, is exergonic, resulting in the excited triplet 1A, which contains most of the spin density in its ring. Subsequent cleavage of the N-oxygen bond of the isoxazolone exhibits a moderate barrier of 15.7 kcal per mole, but it is followed by a barrierless and irreversible decarboxylation, yielding the carbon-nitrogen triplet radical. The direct coordination and addition of the, the radical to acrylonitrile was found to exhibit a high total free energy barrier of 22.5 kcal per mole. As a consequence of this, this radical prefers to undergo rapid intersystem crossing instead of reacting with the olefin and radical recombination through a minimum energy crossing point to form the observed adenine intermediate 4A. This intermediate is capable of quenching the excited state of iridium F in a second, slightly endergonic energy transfer event with a dynamic vertical triplet energy of 62.8 kcal per mole, yielding the triplet state azirin 4A. From here, breakage of the azirin CC bond is kinetically favored over breakage of the CN bond, thus explaining the selectivity for the olefin insertion at this position. The subsequent attack of the internal sp2 type radical to acrylonitrile is kinetically and thermodynamically favored over the addition of the persistent tertiary radical of the azirin, which therefore adds to acrylonitrile after the alkene radical, thus rationalizing the observed regioselectivity of the reaction. The resulting intermediate then undergoes a facile intersystem crossing and radical-radical recombination to yield the observed product. Is this truly a two-step process as we saw in the DFT calculations? How are we sure of having an azurine intermediate? The azurine intermediate was indeed visible via GC and NMR analysis. Additionally, its formation and disappearance could be monitored via time course study, as you see here on the left, by stopping the reaction and checking the NMR and NMR yield at different times. Plus, when using a radical trap, such as BHT, that you see in the right hand side of the slide, we could detect via high resolution mass the azerin containing adult 5A. Therefore, we could conclude, according to these observations, that we were dealing with a two step energy transfer process. Next mechanistic riddle we had to solve was the nature of the excitation. 
are both steps energy transfer, as we saw in the DFT calculations, or some photoredox mechanism can be operative in one of the two steps. From CV studies, that you see here on the left, we saw that the isoxazolone 1A had no redox activity, therefore rendering energy transfer for the first step more likely. Then for the second step from azirine to our one pyrrolin product, the azirine showed indeed one single irreversible oxidation event at 2.24 volt. But when screening, as you see here on the right, more oxidizing photocatalysts, but with lower triplet energy and therefore less possibility to undergo energy transfer, like acridinium, only neglectable amounts of products were recovered, suggesting that the second step could be as well energy transfer. Once we were confident of the reaction mechanism, we explored its applicability via high throughput screening. For the design of the 96 well plate, we chose a series of cyclic oxim starting materials and coupling partners with the different electronic and steric demand. Our results, as you see here on the right, were not too optimistic, but thanks to high throughput experiments, we quickly shed light on key aspects of our method, such as the importance of the gem dimethyl substitution pattern in the isoxazolone to deliver the desired product, the tendency to react for only electron poor olefins, and it is also worth noting that isocyanates and disubstituted alkynes showed promising reactivity. For more details on the well plate sample analysis by a GC and automated workup with our pipetting robot, which you see here in action, please refer to our supporting information and to the paper referenced here. Based on the high throughput results, we were able to design our scope, which, as displayed in the scheme, features entries with mono and disubstituted electron poor olefins. And in the latter case, as you see from compound 3B, the pyrroline type products could be generated in higher diastereoselectivity, thus fulfilling our initial aim when we had the idea for the project. Additionally, the tolerance for protected alcohols, heterocycles like furan, thioesters, was also evaluated. The involvement of 1,1 disubstituted alkenes was briefly considered, allowing for the synthesis of highly substituted and heterocycles bearing a quaternary center at the C3 position, as in the case of the ASA Spirocycle 3F. Moreover, as seen already in high throughput screen, isocyanates and alkynes delivered, successfully delivered the products, as well as protected imines. This method was also applied on drugs like gemfibrosil and cyprofibrate, which are much more complex than the coupling partners we initially used. Regarding variation of the azoxazolone moiety instead, both change of the aromatic function and of the substituents in C4 were considered. The reaction outcome resulted particularly sensitive to changes of substituents in C4, as far as we could see, and only alkyl moieties were tolerated in this position. Lastly, our sensitivity screen exhibited a quite robust reaction with only low light intensity and low temperature having an impact, negative impact on the reactivity. For the full list of scope entries, please refer to the publication. Once we got our N heterocyclic products, we next involved them in derivatizations to further substantiate the synthetic utility of the vicinal dicarbofunctionalization protocol we developed. Firstly, a chemo and diacero-selective reduction of the iminyl function was achieved with sodium borohydrate, affording the tetra-substituted pyrrolidine 6A as a mixture of 3S5S and 3R5R enantiomers. When a stronger reducing agent, such as lithium aluminum hydride, was allowed to react with 3N, the partial reduction of the vine rib amide to the corresponding aldehyde was observed, leaving the one pyrroline backbone untouched. The hydrolysis under acidic conditions of 3A led instead to the ring opening of the iminyl cycle and formation of the delta-keto-iminium chloride 6C. 
We then exploited the good living group ability of the Vinerib amide in 3N to synthesize the keto pyrroline 6D in 77% yield. As a last post-modification effort, we performed an epoxidation of imine 3A, unlocking access to the interesting fused oxaziridine 6E in high diastereosyl activity. This was all for the 3 plus 2 cycle addition of azirines via cascade energy transfer. We hope you enjoyed the talk and also to have demonstrated that this project at a conceptual interface between bifunctional reagents and strain release can represent a starting point for further investigations in the domain of n heterocycle synthesis via energy transfer catalysis. Last, I want to warmly thank my brilliant co-authors, Matis, Preeti, Felix, Niklas and Florian. Constantine for the life-saving X-ray data, Frank for his supervision, and the whole glorious group here in pictures. The Humboldt Foundation for financial support and you for your kind attention. Feel free to drop us an email or write comments below the video in case you have any questions. Ciao! Thank you, Alessia, for that excellent presentation and for sharing your insight with the community. If you enjoyed this episode of Synthesis Workshop and want to see more discussions on cutting-edge research in organic chemistry, please like the video, share it, and subscribe to the channel. You can also follow us on X and LinkedIn to stay updated on upcoming talks and new research spotlight episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.